Please have a seat. And uh, if we've not met, my name's Ian Garrett. And uh, before we get into the Bible tonight, let me lead us in prayer. Father, through this part of your written word, please speak what we need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, as you'll have gathered, this is our first welcome night for students newly arrived or newly back in town. And if that's you, I guess this time of year poses two questions. And the first is, who are you going to be? A few years back, I got a call from the mother of a student called Simon, and she said, uh, he's coming up to Newcastle, would you look out for him? He's very easy to spot because he's just reinvented himself and now has blue hair. And she was right. Uh, so when he first came along, I went up to him uh, at the back and I said, hi, um, this may sound odd, but I just have the feeling your name is Simon. Is that, is that right? And he looked horrified and he said, this isn't one of those churches where God tells you everything about <laughs> everyone, is it? I said, no, 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 he only tells me names. And um, he looked even more horrified. I said, that's a joke, your mother has uh, phoned me. But it is true, isn't it? Coming or coming back to uni gives you the opportunity to reinvent yourself. So who are you going to be? Especially if so far you've identified as Christian. The other question this time of year poses, I think, is what are you here for? So another new student said to me at the back, I remember he said, really haven't got a clue why I'm here. He said, I guess it's just the next stage of the educational sausage machine. It's what everyone else at my school was doing. It's what was expected of me, and I guess that's the only reason I'm here. Now, the people running Freshers' Week would say, no, 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 the big reason you're here is to have fun, and, and can we further define fun as uh, drinking to excess and getting into bed with people and so on and so on? I trust you've got better reasons for being here, uh, like stretching your mind and your skills, learning to live independently, making friends wisely. But if you're a Christian, everything you do, work, play, the lot, should be shot through with God's overriding purpose for your life, which is to know him better, live for him, and make him known. That's what it's all about. So we're going to look tonight at that second Bible reading, which is all about God's overriding purpose for us if we're trusting in Jesus. And if you're not sure that's you, if that's the biggest area where you've got to decide who you're going to be, can I just encourage you to stay stuck into church while you do that? Because I want to say, we don't think that church is just for the convinced and the committed. Um, you'll find plenty of people come along here uh, who want and need the space, maybe from family, to grow into their own convictions, to sort out what they really believe. And we aim, at least, to be that kind of space. I can't speak for how well we do. So we won't assume anything of you. And if you just need to come along and lie low and think and ask questions, that's fine. Please do. So would you turn in the Bibles to page 1015? Uh, you should find Bibles uh, around you in the, uh, in the seats. Uh, verses come up on the screens anyway, but it's good to see that actually uh, it's, it's in the Bible. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 to 12 is what we're going to look at. And it says two things to people trusting in Jesus. And the first is who we are and what we're here for. So look down to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. This was written by the Apostle Peter, follower of Jesus for three years. He's just been saying that most people are living in God's world without any reference to God. And then to Christians, he says, by contrast, verse 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In other words, while most people are saying, you know, I do not want God in my life, he's saying God has taken possession of you if you are a Christian so that you live for him and speak for him so that others around you 
have the chance of coming to know him too. And partly that happens by us being holy, to lift that word from verse 9, which just means belonging to God and so being different. So, for example, I remember a student who put her trust in Jesus here one Sunday evening, and she'd been weighing that up for a while. The big issue for her was the boyfriend whom she'd been sleeping with against her better judgment. But she finally saw it was infinitely more important to have Jesus than to have the boyfriend. So she committed herself to Jesus, and uh, she went back that Sunday night to tell the boyfriend that she wasn't going to be sleeping with him anymore. He said that was outrageous, and so she said, in that case, we're not going out anymore. He was here the next Sunday. I met him at the back for the first time. I I didn't know who it was, and I I said, "Um, what's brought you along? And he said, well, my girlfriend has just dumped me for Christianity, and I want to know what's got into her. (laughs) And the answer is Jesus had got into her. He'd forgiven her. He'd come into her life by his spirit. She now wanted to be different. That wasn't difficult in one way for her. So being holy, living differently because we belong to Jesus, will point people to Jesus, but only if we somehow let them know we're Christians, somehow wear that label. So a while back, the Christian unions here got into what they called service evangelism. We are going to tell people about Jesus just by serving them, they said. That was the idea. And so, uh, for example, they went around the kitchens in halls, washing up and cleaning the place, which in some of the boys' corridors was like mucking out pigs. And so it was really noticed and appreciated. But if that is all you do, people will not make any link with Jesus as the reason you're doing it. They'll just think you're nice or weird or both. But they're not going to think you're doing it because of Jesus unless you speak about him or try and invite him along to places where other people will speak about him, like this. So verse 9 again. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim, speak the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So if you are a Christian student here, in your time here, or the rest of your time here, Will you set yourself to make Jesus known? And the rest of us here, including me, will we keep plugging away at that wherever we are in life? Now, in a new place or with new people, it's not easy to know how to get started with that, is it? So let me tell you about my goddaughter, Susie. She's now graduated, but I was on the phone to her during her freshers' week, and she said, Ian, I'm a bit worried that I've not actually said to anyone yet that I'm a Christian. She said, my flatmates have seen my Bible out in my room. They know that I've been along to church uh, already my first weekend. But I, I haven't, as she put it, I haven't sat them down, told them I'm a Christian and let them have it. To which I said, Susie, relax and give it a month. I said, I totally agree about not sitting them down and letting them have it. Please don't do that. Just give it a month, I said, and then ask whether they know you're a Christian. And uh, if you are openly going to church, if the Bible stays out in your room, if you have friends around from Christian Union and you tell them how you met them, I said, they'll soon know you're a Christian. They might even start asking you questions. And I phoned her just two weeks later and she said three of her five flatmates had already invited themselves along to church or see you with her because they were so intrigued. They had never met a Christian before. But here's one of the most important things to say. This bit of the Bible is not speaking to me or you individually. It's speaking to us. To those of us trusting Jesus, it says we are a people for God's own possession. And to know God better, live for him and make him known, you and I need other Christians. So we've got to belong in a real way to a church. There are Christian unions out there which can help you find the other Christians in your union, do events on campus, but your spiritual base has got to be a church. We would love it if you settled here for that, but can I say settle in some church 
soon. That's maybe the most important thing to say. Settle in some good church soon. Because the great thing about church is that you can move halfway up the country, or for some of you, it's halfway around the world, and yet you, you find instant family, don't you? God's family. I know it still takes time to make friends in church, and you need to be patient about that, as, as Bethan uh, was saying. But there's that instant head start that we all have Jesus in common. Okay, that's who we are and what we're here for. The other thing Peter tells us is how to blow that and how to show that. Look on to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which war against your soul. Now, the upside of this Bible translation that we use is that it aims to be accurate and word for word. The downside is that it uses not exactly everyday vocabulary like sojourners, you know, as if I'm going to say to you over coffee afterwards outside, hi, how's your uh, sojourn in Newcastle going so far? But sojourners just means temporary residents, like you students in term time. And exiles just means you don't really belong here. So Peter is saying, if you are a Christian, you don't belong to this God-rejecting world and the way it lives. So verse 11 again. He says, Beloved, I urge you as as non-belongers to abstain from the passions of the flesh, in other words, from following your fallen desires for the wrong things, which war against your soul. In other words, which are going to be spiritually bad for you. And to see what Peter had in mind, just look ahead to chapter 4, verse 3. 1 Peter 4, verse 3. If you just turn over the page there. 1 Peter 4, verse 3, where he says, For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you don't join them in the same flood of debauchery and they they malign you, in other words, they, they, they talk you down. And that's a snapshot, isn't it, of some of Freshers Week stuff, some of the uh, parties that those of you in Cypher get invited to, uh, and of a lot of life in uni and beyond. It's a picture of people swimming around, apparently happily, in this pool of passions, including the predictable ones like drink and sex, but not only those ones, and saying, come on in, the water's lovely. Um, I don't know about you, I am a cold water wimp, I hate it, and so when I'm on holiday with family and friends and they plunge into the sea and they say to me, come on in, the water's lovely, I can see through it, because we can't afford to go to the Caribbean, we go to Ireland. (laughs) And I know that without a heavy duty wetsuit or a lot more global warming, it will not be lovely. And whether or not we are cold water wimps, God wants us, if we're Christians, to be sin wimps. So that when we hear the non-Christian world say, come on in, it's lovely, we just see through it. And we think, no, it's not, because it isn't. But that's easier said than done, isn't it? I remember my very first week at uni, sometime shortly after the flood, someone asked it, if I wanted to come to a film with a group of others and I stupidly said yes without asking which film. And when we got to the cinema, it was obvious from the posters what kind of film it was. It was an 18 and on the poster was a scantily clad woman and from reading the blurb, I could predict that she was going to get less clad as time went on. And so we've all been here, haven't we? I knew I had to walk away, but like all of you, I was worried what they were going to think. But turn back over to chapter 2, verse 11. Here's the compass bearing for for moments like that. Chapter 2, verse 11. What does it say? Beloved, I urge you as non-belongers, you don't belong in films like that, Christian, to abstain from the passions of the flesh which war against your soul. That's only going to be spiritually bad for you. And I stewed... Uh, on it as the queue moved forward. The right thing never gets easier to do, does it? I finally said, look, now I've seen what it is. I don't actually want to watch this. And I headed back to my room on my own. And there's nothing worse than being on your own, is there? 
No, that is not true. It is far better to be on your own than to be where you shouldn't be. It is far better to be on your own than to lose your freedom and your self-respect to peer pressure. And actually, I didn't feel on my own. I felt, uh, as you often do, especially close to the Lord Jesus. When you obey, when your, your neck has been on the line, Disobedience, end of verse 11, wars against your soul, doesn't it? That's why we know, each of us, that compromised Christians are miserable Christians. Whereas in obedience, you know Jesus more closely and you know you are free from just following the crowd. So as Bethan said earlier, sometimes we will feel like outsiders. That's putting it negatively. Let me put it positively. Following Jesus sets you free from just following the crowd. There are times when you look back and you regret being an insider. You say, I should have been an outsider. And it's Jesus who gives us the, uh, the capacity to do that. We'll look down to verse 11 again. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which war against your soul... Keep your conduct among the Gentiles, that is the people beyond the reach of the Bible, basically. Keep your conduct among them honorable. Another translation says, live such good lives among the Gentiles, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So that's how the Lord wants us to live among those who are not yet Christians. Here's the first way that we can blow it. Uh, let me introduce you to Will the Worldly here up on screen. Uh, Will is a Christian. Um, he recognizes Jesus as king of him. That's why there's the crown above him. Uh, and he wants other people to know Jesus. So he thinks that means being out there and doing what they're doing. But the trouble is for Will, doing what they're doing means getting regularly drunk, which means people don't see him being any different. They don't see Jesus being king of him. And plus, he's now ashamed to say anything Christian because he knows in his heart of hearts that he's blown it. So next up on screen, meet Pete the Pious. There he is, floating somewhere off the planet, playing his harp, as he does in CU, because he can, he can see how Will has blown it. And so his solution is to live in a bubble of Christian friendships and meetings, not realizing that he's just blown it in an equal but opposite way. Not by failing to be different, but by failing to be visible to anyone who's not a Christian. But you end up in the same place. You're, you're not pointing anyone to Jesus. So thirdly on the screen, uh, meet Barbara the Biblical. Trust the women to get it right. And she says, look, you've got to do verse 11 and abstain from the passions of the flesh. So Pete's got a point. But you've also got to do verse 12 and live such good lives among the Gentiles. So Will's got a point too. You've got to live among the people around you, but you've got to keep your holiness and not lose it. Let me say a word to those of you here who know that you have already blown it like Will, that that's uppermost in your mind. Maybe during the whole of last year, if you're a second or third year wanting to make a fresh start now, maybe during this past summer or gap year, maybe during your first few days here, uh, if you're a first year. If and when you blow it, the thing to do is always to trust God's forgiveness and start again. That is the Christian life. Trust God's forgiveness and start again. That is the Christian life. Because look at the end of verse 10. What does it say? Very end of verse 10. You have received mercy. And mercy means God's commitment to forgive you every time you need it this side of heaven. And he can do that because Jesus, his son, anticipated your whole lifetime sin, past and future, the whole lot, and he paid for the forgiveness of it all on the cross. So there's nothing that's going to take him by surprise. Nothing that he hasn't banked on having to forgive. 
So if you've blown it, and however you've blown it, trust God's forgiveness and start again. That's the Christian life. So years back, there was a fresher called Ben. He messed up massively in Fresher's week. He got completely plastered one night. He was utterly ashamed of himself. And I remember him saying to me, I've blown all hopes of pointing any of my friends to Jesus. And I said, Ben, no, you haven't. And he said, but they had to carry me home because of the state that I was in. How am I going to be any sort of witness to Jesus after that? And I said, it depends what you do next. If you pretend nothing happened or that it's okay for Christians to behave like that, you're right, you'll have absolutely no Christian impact at all. But if you say to them what you've said to me, that you are ashamed and that that is not how a Christian should be, and if you get up and get going again and show them that Jesus forgives people and gives people fresh starts, they'll get the gospel loud and clear from you. A year later, uh, Ben was CU president. A few years after that, uh, he was in Japan as a missionary. If you've blown it, and however you've blown it, trust God's forgiveness and start again. That's the Christian life. Just look down to verse 12 to end uh, with a bit of Bible realism about pointing people to Jesus. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honourable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So the last bit is what we really want, isn't it? In other words, so that they come to glorify Jesus as their own Lord and Saviour. But notice the middle bit. So that when they speak against you. And that's saying that, you know, even if Christian people respect you for the life you live, which they will they will also give you stick for it. So they may respect you for not getting drunk, but mock you because you can't take your alcohol. Respect you for what you believe about uh, sex being for marriage only, but mock you for not being able to pull a girl or guy, or that you're still a virgin if you are. So let me, tell you, let me end by telling you about a student here a while back called Tim. For two years, Tim was the only Christian uh, in an extraordinarily non-Christian house, uh, which is not something that I would recommend doing. And he had to contend with everything, porn, drink, drugs, girlfriends, moving in, you name it. And I knew how much stick they gave him for being a Christian, and he was constantly discouraged by whether his witness was having any impact on them at all. Well, in his last term, in uh, one of the last few Sundays of term, I met this guy I'd never seen before. I asked him what brought him along, and he said, I'm Tim's housemate. Uh, he knew me because I, I met up with Tim to read the Bible one-to-one. -one. I was the, uh, the church weirdo professional. And um, Tim was elsewhere in, in, in the kind of coffee mill, so he didn't hear any of this. And this housemate said, I'm here because for two years I have given Tim nothing but stick for his faith. But actually, I respect him more than anybody I know because he has integrity and the rest of us don't. And I knew I owed it to him to come along here a bit before the end of my time at uni to hear what he believed and why. And when I told Tim that later that night, I gave him a ring. As you can expect, he was unbelieving because he had no idea that was going on beneath the surface of that housemate, beneath the surface of all that stick. And by and large, we will not know what is going on in people either as we try to live out what we've been hearing tonight. It can be a very long game, sometimes a lifelong game. But I want to say to you, what a purpose to live for, that during your time here and the rest of your time on earth. People hear about Jesus through, through you. People see something of Jesus imperfectly in you. And some of them come to faith through you. What could be better than that if you're a Christian? If you're a Christian, that's who you are. That's what you're here for. So settle with your Christian family in some good church soon and get together with them 
in living that purpose out. Let's pray. Father, for those of us here who are still unsure what they believe, please would you use our church or another to lead them towards faith and confidence in you. For all of us already trusting in you, please give us boldness and wisdom as we seek to live for you among many who don't. And especially for those here among us this evening seeking to do that as they start a new life in Newcastle, we pray for your spirit to strengthen them to be faithful to you. In Jesus' name, amen.